This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. As we heat up the planet with more greenhouse gases, everyone talks about a natural solution. Protect world forests, plant billions more trees, and use agriculture to capture carbon. New science questions that. A January paper published in the journal Science Advances warns, quote, the temperature tipping point of the terrestrial biosphere lies not at the end of the century or beyond, but within the next 20 to 30 years. We've reached the lead author, postdoctoral scientist Catherine Duffy at Northern Arizona University. Catherine, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thank you so much for having me. Before we dive into the upper limits of plants, why is it so important for not just scientists, but the public to understand what your new global review of plants tells us? That's a really good question. So one important finding, whether you're a scientist or not, is that the terrestrial biosphere, which is made up of all the plants on the Earth system, we treat it as one of the main spheres in the Earth system. I was trained as an Earth system scientist, so I just wanted to define that. Um, Between the terrestrial biosphere and the oceans, together they pick up almost half of all of our carbon emissions that we anthropogenically emit. Um, The terrestrial biosphere is is absorbing about 30% of those. And if the terrestrial biosphere were to stop or slow that pickup, it would result in ever-increasing quantities of carbon dioxide, for example, in Earth's atmosphere, which feeds back into global warming and climate change. Is this warning, and I consider it a warning, is it based on theory or models, or can your team back it up with hard data from observations on the ground? Yeah, so in order to complete the analysis that you're talking about today, we actually use the largest and longest-lived carbon monitoring network called FlexNet. And FlexNet is a network of towers all over the globe. It's a collaborative effort. The data is open. And these towers are measuring CO2 exchange between the plant, the plant communities and the atmosphere. So the data is absolutely backed up. Anyone could reproduce it. Um, it is also grounded in basic principles of thermodynamics. So we kind of went back to first principles for this analysis and said, how does this work as a function of temperature? And we threw two and a half decades worth of data at that question. So I guess listeners will want to know, well, why does this matter? So how much of human greenhouse pollution is currently safely captured by land plants? What's the estimate for that? About 30% currently. So for everything we put up, about 30% of it is being grabbed by plants and brought back down into their structures or the soil. Exactly. And then those plants, often if they're larger things, larger plants like trees with big stems or bowls or trunks, then that carbon is often stored for a longer period of time and or it is incorporated into soil for longer term storage as well. So if we stop picking, if, if, the terrestrial biosphere slows this accumulation. It's not only the atmosphere that is changing as far as the quantities of greenhouse gases, but the potential storage in the air system could also be altered. So you're a specialist in something called phenology. What is that, and how can that help us measure climate change? Yeah, great. It's, it's cool to see that you dug through. So phenology, it's one way to think about it is it's the timing of living things. So if you think about leaves essentially creating buds and then leafing out and then maximum canopy greenness and then in the fall, if you're a deciduous tree, senescence where the the leaves turn red and orange and then fall, um, that's really one example of phenology, but you can also witness phenology in animals and things like that. Um, I spent the last couple of years building a bunch of software to help other scientists do uh, cross-scale integrations of phenological data, everything from satellites to digital repeat photography cameras and in situ on the ground observations. But phenology is important because we're talking about 
global warming and increasing temperatures. And a lot of scientists have asked, as we're warming, could, could plants potentially have a longer growing season? Could that be important to consider as a potential impact for climate change? Like, you know, could we green the Arctic? Could plants um, photosynthesize for longer? The jury is still out on that. For some plants, it really matters how much daylight they have and what we call photo period, and, and that really signals their timing. For other plants, perhaps additional temperature could extend their growing season, but kind of from ecosystem to ecosystem all over the map, we are very actively trying to unpack that question, and the jury is still out. We're not sure. What made you and your team suspect there is a tipping point for carbon capture by plants? Yeah, interestingly, we didn't um, pursue this analysis looking for a tipping point. We actually just sought out to generate a temperature dependence curve for global photosynthesis, and that is important because we needed to understand what was the temperature maximum for photosynthesis for land carbon uptake, and and we weren't really thinking about being on the brink of that threshold. We just wanted to generate that curve because it helps us understand things like future climate change, the accuracy of terrestrial biosphere models, which are really key in understanding future projections of global warming. Essentially, if you look at all of the best models for the terrestrial biosphere, when you look at temperature, they say completely different things. It's a total spaghetti plot. And so we need to understand that relationship better. So we threw, you know, two and a half decades worth of data at this question. And as we generated those temperature dependence curves, we had this sort of, oh, no moment where we said, wow, the last decade, which is also the warmest on record, during that last decade, we started to cross this temperature threshold for peak photosynthesis. And that wasn't something we went in looking for. It wasn't a question we necessarily thought we would be answering. Um, but as we generate those temperature dependence curves, we can now see where we are today relative to that temperature maximum. And when we discovered that over this last decade, we have begun to spend time past that temperature maximum for land carbon uptake, what it brought to light was that any, and I mean any additional warming, gives us more time past that temperature maximum. And what that means is that photosynthesis is now in decline. And, it's, and so it's starting to slowly enact some of these tipping points that we bring up in the paper. So yes, your paper looks at heat limits for two kind of opposite operations when it comes to carbon dioxide. We have photosynthesis, where the, it grabs the carbon, and respiration, where it releases it. Could you describe what you found as far as the temperature limits for those two different processes? So there's two main processes that cycle carbon for the terrestrial biosphere. The first is photosynthesis, which is that take up of carbon. And then the second is respiration, and that is the release of carbon via plants, microbes, bacteria, things like that. And so we need to consider both when we're thinking about a carbon balance or a carbon budget. One of the alarming things that we found in our study, and that is corroborated by experimental data, is that the temperature maximum for that release of carbon is actually far higher it's somewhere in the realm of 50 to 70 degrees Celsius. What that means is that when photosynthesis is declining because of global climate change, because of warming, it's actually concurrent with an upswing in the release of carbon. And that is one of the tipping points we bring up in the paper. It's this reversal in the land sink of carbon. Instead of the terrestrial biosphere taking in carbon and storing it, it could potentially flip the sign of that signal and release it. You know, I operate an experimental geothermal greenhouse here in southern Canada, and most of my plants, I can see, they begin to grow vigorously around 65 degrees Fahrenheit or 18 C. But around 95 degrees, it's just getting too hot, 35 C. Most of the growth stops. The plants are just protecting themselves from the heat. So 
this looks like we're going to get periods of that maximum heat appearing in different parts of the world. It's not evenly spread. I, I looked at the maps in your paper, and some places get hit harder than others and sooner than others. Absolutely true. And that's, that's so interesting with your greenhouse data, because that's very much in alignment with what we found in our study. Around 18 degrees Celsius is sort of the sweet spot for C3 photosynthesis, which is you know, you can think of trees and, and those types of um, plants. There are, is also C4, which are grasses, and those evolved to grow during periods that were, like, warmer and drier. Uh, yeah, so there's a couple, when, you're, when we're looking at where these temperature effects will come into play first, sort of where and when, um, there's a couple of things to think about. The first is that warming is not uniform. For example, the Arctic is warming much more rapidly than a lot of other regions of the globe, and it is actually one of those biomes that we see past the thermal maximum for photosynthesis quite rapidly. Um, and it's a little surprising, right, because we think of boreal forests and, and northern forests as, quote-unquote, temperature limited, but essentially we will, because they've aligned themselves within current climate, as we change that climate very rapidly, they are some of the first to experience these shifts past the temperature maximum. Now, the opposite end of that spectrum, as far as like what's driving this change, could be seen in tropical rainforests. And that is actually because tropical rainforests are already quite warm. So even a little bit of warming pushes them past these temperature thresholds for, for peak productivity or peak carbon uptake. Have we already seen some of the first plant carbon tipping point temperatures show up in some places? We have. Um, what was really interesting when we generated this temperature dependence curve is it sort of helped give us a perspective on some of these um, drastic heat wave events that we've seen over the last decade. Um, one that comes to mind was a heat wave in the early 2000s in Europe, and we saw a complete cessation of the uptake of carbon by land plants during that heat wave. And so now we can sort of place into context some of these extreme events. Um, I think the big question, the big looming question for me, and one that I would like to tackle, is how often and how many of these extreme events can the terrestrial biosphere sort of, quote, unquote, take before we start to see drastic alteration of these ecosystems? things like mortality, things like migrations of, ecos of, of sort of ecosystems and ecosystem type. Well, and the thing is, in my experience, uh, plants don't just turn on and off like a light switch. If you put them under extreme stress, whether it's heat or cold, they can become stunted and they don't really reach their full potential. We saw in the 2010 Russian heat wave that about half of the wheat crop of Russia was lost. So I, I think there could be two kinds of carbon loss here, really. You have the carbon loss that occurs when the plants stop, let's say, temporarily growing uh, during the heat wave. So that's carbon that could have been taken out of the atmosphere, but it wasn't. But then if it goes too far and the plants die, they release all their carbon. And we've seen that with some forest fires, wildfires, and, and uh, forest burning, releasing their carbon. Absolutely, and one of my co-authors on this paper, who was also my PhD advisor, um, Christopher Schwalm, has done some amazing sort of questioning of the resilience of the terrestrial biosphere to drought and heat and has some fantastic publications out on that. But what you are stating is correct, is that even one very extreme event can change an ecosystem. And we need to understand where ecosystems are more resilient and where they are less because we need to prioritize how we help the terrestrial biosphere continue so that it can continue to help us um, in the future. And understanding that resiliency of ecosystems is a really key component. This is Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith. Our guest is Catherine Duffy from Northern Arizona University. People who want to minimize global warming, including some paid by fossil fuel interests, they promise us the extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will be great for plant growth, so no worries. What do you think? Yeah, another hot topic of debate, and that is actually something we investigated in the work that we're covering today. 
So a lot of people think that essentially with additional CO2 in the atmosphere, additional quote-unquote plant food, that the terrestrial biosphere will just take up more and more carbon. Now, we have two and a half decades worth of data. CO2 in the atmosphere has increased over that period. So we threw that in as a variable and said, does this change our temperature dependence curve? And the answer was no. What's interesting about that, about the CO2 temperature um, relationship, is you can think of it as two sides of the same coin. So if you have additional CO2 in the atmosphere, with that additional CO2, you have additional warming. And so some scientists think that maybe these two sort of cancel each other out. We found that there wasn't a notable effect um, as a fertilization of CO2. And, and here's one way that I sort of have been thinking about it as I've seen some of these debates play out across the literature. If, so I live in Arizona. Um, I live in the desert. And if you were to walk across a hot desert, say you started at sunrise and it was nice and cool, but as the day goes on, um, the temperatures rise, you could have a never-ending buffet of, of food next to you, but at some point your body is going to be struggling with the temperature effects. It's, it's focused on its own physiology, and no amount of food is going to help you survive 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So there are limits to this, quote-unquote, CO2 fertilization effect. It's not that it's not real. I think it can happen, but it's not... It's, it's, it's not never-ending, essentially. There are limits to it. Having additional food can help you earlier on in that day when it's not quite so hot, but when you get to temperatures that stress your own body or stress your own metabolism, that additional food no longer plays a role. Well, the other thing I think some people do when they're downplaying this issue is they say, well, we'll just plant uh, the crops that uh, grow better in the tropics. We'll plant them further north. But I don't know how many people are really ready for a diet of sorghum and cassava and, and maize as opposed to what they're eating now. Absolutely true. And, and beyond just what we eat, I also think about our local economies that rely on the biosphere, things like timber harvest. And also the ecosystem services beyond just carbon uptake or agricultural output, things like microclimate cooling, evaporative you know, demand, things like that, that, that have regional areas of cooling that don't necessarily have to do with like planting this crop at that latitude. Um, and also like how those various, our human infrastructures have been built around the terrestrial biosphere and how all of those infrastructures will have to shift. And I know a few scientists set up testing stations for plant-atmosphere relations. I, I think one was in Manitoba, Canada, another one was in Alaska. And they heated the soil under controlled plots and then measured carbon dioxide released by the plants, like simulated global warming. Did you check their findings against your study, or could you? Um, absolutely. We did look at some of that data. Um, a lot of people call those space experiments or free air exchange experiments where you have free air, you're adding additional CO2, you're warming, and you're doing various controls. You have warming without CO2, you have CO2 without warming, and so on and so forth. And those are really important sort of benchmarks for us to sort of check the reality of what we are seeing. I would say first that it is generally in agreement. Um, the, the biggest difference is that we are taking ambient temperature and ambient CO2 across every biome across the surface of the Earth. What's different about that analysis and some of these experimental analyses is that they are experiments. They're not necessarily two and a half decades long, some of them. Some of them are. Um, they're not necessarily as long, and they don't necessarily cover the diversity of ecosystems that we do in the ambient in situ data. And so we will, we expect to see differences. We do see some minor ones. Um, but we did use experimental data as benchmarks in the analysis we're talking about today. So to be clear about the focus of this paper, did you include things like soil respiration? I mean, there's billions of organisms down in the soil. They have their own carbon release and capture uh, cycle. And then we have plankton out in the ocean. Uh, did you include those things in this study? In this 
study, we really only included the terrestrial biosphere. There are CO2 exchange networks that exist over the oceans, but they're quite different. In this case, we really focused on the terrestrial biosphere because it is one of the biggest questions, like looming question marks, in the future of climate change and how um, carbon will be cycled and to what quantity. So it's also important to note that, so we're not talking about the oceans, we're also not including things like disturbance events, hurricanes, wildfires. We're not including things like deforestation. We are truly just looking at the metabolism of the biosphere, of all those plants in the Earth system, and how they are likely to react to temperature. A number of scientists have suggested that the ocean itself may turn from a sink to a source, especially if plankton is affected by the, the oceans are really heating up quite quickly. And in a tweet, you said, when the ocean's ability to absorb heat stalls, declines, atmospheric loading will feed into a whole host of land surface climate feedbacks. Could you talk to us about that? Absolutely. And first, I will caveat that I am no ocean scientist, but I, I, can, I can read the data, and, and that tweet that I sent out, I thought that that graph was very compelling. And what that graph shows us is how much heat the ocean is currently taking up. However, that the ability of the ocean, because of really long-term cycling, the amount, the quantity of heat that it can continue to take up stalls at various points in time and perhaps stops, right? And so if we think about the ocean taking up less heat, where can that heat go? It ends up in the atmosphere, which feeds into the type of work that we showed in our paper where heat extremes impact the land surface uptake of carbon. So this is another sort of global feedback into climate change potential tipping point type scenario where the oceans take up less heat, therefore that energy is in the atmosphere and the terrestrial biosphere experiences, experiences it and reacts to it. We had the Swiss scientist uh, Thomas Crowther on our show talking about planting billions more trees to capture more carbon in the future and help us out with climate change somewhat. I wonder how your new paper affects proposals like that. Yeah, good question. So I think when we are considering things like seedlings, planting billions or trillions of trees, but we need to think about the resilience of those seedlings to the climate extremes that they are likely to experience and how our temperature dependence curve plays into the future climate of where you've planted that tree. Because just because a tree dies, say a seedling dies, doesn't mean that the carbon is re released immediately but it does mean that it's released in a less stable form or more volatile form. And so I do think that planting trees can be part, like, but one of many of the solutions that we can pursue, but we have to think about future climate. We have to think about future stress, and we really have to manage and restore the biosphere such that it will be resilient to climate change, essentially, we have been relying on quote-unquote free or inexpensive um, technology, as in nature is the most efficient machine out there. Um, we've been relying on the uptake of these forests, of the uptake of planting trees to mitigate our own impact. And I think that what our paper sort of points to is we can't rely on that service forever, or at least it is more fragile than we previously realized. So we also need to curb our emissions, we need to be conscious of our own decisions, and we need to take this fragility into account when we are relying on the biosphere to pick up carbon for us. Totally right, but you study how plants react in changing seasons, it's kind of what you do. Won't plants adapt and evolve to handle these hotter conditions? Great question, and that is one that came up in peer review, um, and it's one we checked for as well. So a lot of scientists talk about temperature acclimation. So essentially, can plants be relatively plastic? Can they adapt to higher temperatures? Because we have 
more than two decades of data, we separated the data from the warmest decade and the previous decade, and we chopped it up in other time steps within that time frame, and again asked, is this temperature dependence curve changing? Is it moving up at all? And the answer is that it didn't. So we didn't see any temperature acclimation. Now, there's a couple of ways to think about that. Um, first, a lot of the terrestrial biosphere are large, woody, long-lived species, right? Trees that are over 100 years old. So how, how plastic can they be? Um, migration takes a while, things like that. Um, but also, we should think about the stochasticity of climate change. While there is kind of steady warming, that warming is somewhat chaotic or messy. It plays out in extreme events, um, both warm and cold, um, but those warm events or those extreme events are on top of a slow warming. And so the question is, like, how consistent is warming such that plants can really say, okay, now my climate is 2 degrees Celsius warmer all the time, I can adapt to that. But climate change is a little bit more chaotic and stochastic than that. Now, right now, the only viable international climate control agreement we have is the Paris Climate Accord. Many countries counted their big force as part of their commitment to keep climate change below 2 degrees C of global mean warming. What does your new study suggest about those plans? Yeah, so our study calls into question the future viability of us counting on the terrestrial biosphere to absorb some of our emissions, and, and that plays into things like the Paris Accord with the intended nationally determined contributions. And so when we're in these global negotiations um, on a country-by-country -country basis, a lot of these Negotiations include things like, well, for example, the Amazon is going to pick up this much carbon, so as the nation of Brazil, for example, we can emit this much carbon because it's about the net contribution. And uh, not to point any fingers at Brazil <laughs> specifically, but that's like an easy example. And so what we are bringing up is that perhaps instead of counting on the terrestrial biosphere to help us meet emissions goals, we need to really recognize the fragility of that ecosystem service and really prioritize emissions reductions such that we aren't relying on the biosphere to help us meet things like the Paris Climate Accord. Now, what are you working on these days, Catherine? One thing that I really want to do is this last year has made me think a lot about epidemiology, given the COVID-19 pandemic. And what I would like to do is take some of the data that you've seen here that we've talked about and combine it with some other data to really look at the terrestrial biosphere in sort of a dose response type of framework borrowed from epidemiology. And what that would allow us to do is to understand what lethal doses of temperature for the biosphere could be and to, on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis across the globe, make some projections about what sort of mortality we expect to observe. Um, that's one thing I would like to do. Um, another thing that I do for a living is I actually write open source textbooks on how to do data science. And if anyone gets on my GitHub profile, um, everything I do is always open source, totally reproducible, and I generate materials for people to teach themselves how to do data science. So how do people find your work, Catherine Duffy? Um, you can just go on GitHub and look for Catherine Duffy. That's my GitHub username. And everything I do is up there free and fair use. I'm going to spell your name for listeners. It's K-A-T-H-A-R-Y-N Duffy with two S. Yes. Yes, sorry. Thank you for bringing that out because I do, my first name is spelled a little differently. Right. From Northern Arizona University, we have been listening to postdoctoral scientist Catherine Duffy. You can Google a paper, How Close Are We to the Temperature Tipping Point of the Terrestrial Biosphere? Or you can find a link in my weekly show blog at ecoshock.org. That's published every Wednesday. Catherine, thank you so much for doing this work and for talking about it today. Thank you so much, Alex. You asked great questions, and it was a pleasure to speak with you. I'm Alex Smith.
for Radio EcoShock.